This is Trep Wire with a special guest podcast. I'm Haley Keen with Trep, a data modeling and analytics firm for the CMBS, commercial real estate, and CLO markets. I'm with Manis Clancy, Senior Managing Director, and joining us today is Carly Tripp, Global Chief Investment Officer and Head of Investments for Nuvian Real Estate. Welcome, Carly. I know we have a lot of questions planned for you today, so thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, and likewise. So, Nuveen is noted as one of the nation's largest real estate investment managers, and Carly, you are frequently quoted in the media, and recently were featured in a Barron's interview and on CNBC, offering up some of your insights on real estate. Why don't you start by giving our audience a quick overview of your background and how you got started in real estate? Yeah, so I I would love to. Um, I have been in commercial real estate my entire career, Uh, so since coming out of undergrad, And I don't know if the commercial part of it was completely intentional, but I was always really interested in real estate, generally speaking. So I I grew up in a really small bedroom community of Washington, D.C. And growing up, you know, when I was young, I was playing in cornfields. There wasn't a lot of development. And by the time I graduated high school and went off to college, it was like this big master plan community, five grocers within a mile radius great school systems, et cetera. So it had just grown so much. And a few years later, my parents were selling their home, retiring and kind of relocating to the shore. And I was so fixated on how much they bought their house for, how much they sold it for. And I just knew that watching the growth around me was kind of an avenue to pursue investing. And I was always really, really super into math and numbers. I loved The Price is Right as a child. It was my favorite TV show. So I sort of just like destined for the financial world. And so I went to University of Maryland undergrad and I actually found a program at, at Berkeley in California. They, they do have um, an undergraduate program in real estate. So I went and studied and took one of those classes during the summer, one of my summer breaks in college. And, you know, after that, I was just fully, fully into it um, and bought in. And I started, you know, actively looking for, for commercial real estate jobs post-college. So that's what found me in how I found my way into this world, I guess I should say. I, I loved it. I loved traveling. I still do. I like going to visit the different cities um, and just seeing a tangible investment that is much, much simpler uh, to understand in my mind than it is a public we traded company, which I get whiplash watching the public markets every day. I am not built for that. <laughs> um, so I, I've done a lot of things over my career, started as a valuation analyst, moved my way into portfolio management, where I spent the large majority of my career. And you know, today I am global CIO for Nuveen Real Estate and oversee about 200 professionals globally and have my hands kind of in the mix of everything. But my primary role is really on the execution side and just focused on um, performance, transactions, daily asset management, you know, anything else that comes along with those things. Well, even before this interview started, I felt like we were kindred spirits in that we both love commercial real estate. And now knowing that you love the price is right, uh, (laughs) I feel feel even a greater connection, although I'm more of a a Bob Barker guy than a uh, a Drew Carey guy, I have to say, so. I am with you there, 100%. So. Uh, let's jump into some questions for you. You know, as I said to you before we started recording, it's been a really interesting time. Uh, the first time I saw you was on CNBC. In addition to to being a Price is Right junkie, I'm also a CNBC junkie and a Barron's junkie. And then a couple months later, you were there. And, and I loved your observations uh, at, at the time. Uh, but a lot has changed over the last three months. And we'd like to get your your insights into that. You know, we've gone from an extended period of low interest rates and benign inflation last year to surging interest rates and higher costs. How has that changed your outlook for the industry as a whole? Yeah, you know, I think long-term outlook is still really positive, right? So a lot's changed kind of with the macro backdrop and market volatility over the last three months. What hasn't changed is the performance within commercial real estate. So, you know, commercial real estate is an excellent diversifier to any portfolio, and we're kind of seeing why now. Um, it does have kind of this lagged performance results to the general market, typically. 
Uh, it also is really, really super resilient during business cycles. So I think if you look long-term historically, you'll really only see total returns dip consistently during two different cycles, which is really, really unique. I think also if you kind of stack up commercial real estate against other asset classes in inflationary times, so we just looked at this um, during inflationary periods where inflation does exceed 4%, Commercial real estate is the only asset class that that remains overall uh, net positive in terms of, of return. Over the last three months, our experience is that the asset class has been really generally very resilient. We've continued to see you know rental growth, particularly within housing industrial that have been you know kind of on fire these last few years. Uh, alternative sectors are very, very healthy. And so that's, you know, storage, medical office, single family rental, et cetera, all really, really strong, positive growth. And then if you're paying attention to the headlines, even the sectors that, you know, haven't been so popular these last couple years, um, office leasing is, is improving. Um, just this week, there was a lot of reporting on trophy office leasing and rents growing and this flight to quality um, kind of theme coming out of the pandemic. And the same thing, I think, you know, it, within the retail markets as well, which we can, you know, talk, talk about a little bit more in detail if you want. Uh, so generally, commercial real estate's been, been really resilient. What has changed and what has to change as an investor is that strategically, you don't kind of gyrate between headlines, right? It's just not a wise way to invest long term. Tactically, you do have to make some changes, right? So how long you hold, how long until you sell some properties that you've held for a while, how you finance your properties. Uh, those things become really, really important. Also, how you underwrite upon acquisition changes, I think, tactically as you enter a more volatile market environment. So let's stick on that for a second. You know, your inflation comments, you talked about how in past cycles, real estate has done very well in inflationary times, you know, apparently costs being able to be pushed through in terms of higher rental rates and higher leasing rates and so forth during those times. This past week, a guy from Morgan Stanley, one of their analysts said that he thought soon businesses would not be able to push through those costs. And we see some earnings dips as a result. So when you tie that back to commercial real estate, are there parts of commercial real estate that are more resilient to passing through costs and others that are less resilient? So as we see you know, CPI in the high single digits, maybe in the low double digits going forward. Is there some parts of the commercial real estate market where you say, yeah, that's not going to do quite as well in a high inflationary period versus these other ones that have done well and we expect to continue to do well? Yeah, I think it depends. So there's just, there's so many dynamics at play right now, right? And, and really what's driving inflation is obviously the supply side shock. And not only do you have this supply side shock, but you also have this environment where the labor markets are incredibly tight. Um, and I, I saw a headline actually this morning kind of talking and discussing and, and illustrating with actual numbers because there's a lot of headlines that, that don't have the numbers to back them up, um, that, that corporations are now having to pay more for labor, right? Which, which we've seen a little bit here and there. Um, it hasn't really necessarily be, been systemic, but it is today. And so how do you kind of deal with a rising costs of your overall goods and rising costs of, of your employment base? I would say that those right, that rising cost scenario, the inflation scenario hasn't trickled into overall cost of rent yet. The, the increase in rents have really just been driven by extremely healthy markets, very undersupplied markets. If you look at life science, if you look at uh, industrial, if you look at just housing overall, and so that's really what's been driving rents. It hasn't come from this just, you know, net overall increase in costs. Um, but that's not to say it's not going to come. So to answer your question more directly, are certain segments of commercial real estate more resilient? I would say yes. So one, the segments that aren't highly reliant on high levered buyers are going to be just generally more resilient, right? So your, your true sort of institutional, well-located core sort of buyer market is always going to be more resilient. And, and we have, in fact, seen levered buyers generally go away over the last 90 days. 
Um, so that will start to kind of feed over into equity markets. If you peel that back and you kind of like say, all right, well, let's look at core, uh, let's look at institutional and let's look across sectors. I actually think that housing is poised to perform really well. So one dynamic that's changed in the last three months, housing was al already incredibly tight if you look at rental housing. And now, you know, there, there was sort of this theme of pent up rental increases post pandemic, you know, your, your overall NOI was sort of uh, so artificially low during the pandemic as a result of rental deferrals or eviction moratoriums or whatever it is. A lot of this bounce back and growth is just coming off of a bottom, so to speak. As these leases continue to roll over, there should be more embedded um, increases going forward. Again, what's changed is that your cost to own versus cost to rent, that dynamic has completely shifted over these last three months, right? So if you look at the average cost of a mortgage today, it's changed by about, I was just reading this, $400 a month versus what it would have costed you this time last year. That's significant for the average American when we're talking about an average mortgage of say $1,700 a month. So now rents actually look pretty cheap, uh, particularly within the single family rental market compared to the cost to own. So because housing is already kind of very, very tight as it is, and because the cost to own has increased, and uh, also because your rents are more frequently marked to market than other sectors, it's just poised to do extremely well. And I would say, you know, industrial, where you generally have a tendency to have shorter term leases than say other commercial sectors like office and retail, I think having shorter leases um, in an inflationary environment is going to be beneficial than having longer term leases. So there's definitely sectors and then subsectors within the sectors. And then there's also locations within the sectors that are going to perform better than others, um, just simply because they they are under supply. So it's not binary, it's not black and white, but I would say generally feeling really good about housing right now. Uh, I'll go back to something uh, again that you said just a minute ago that you've seen, you know, the levered buyer bid kind of fritter away over the last 90 days from where we sit. It seems like even with, you know, the 10 year yield up maybe 125 basis points over the last six months, the two year up maybe two points over the last year, there hasn't been a real deceleration in economic velocity in CRE. You know, when you see Blackstone buying American campus and, and that office read earlier this week, it just seems like there's been no tapping of the brakes in any meaningful way in commercial real estate buying. Do you, do you agree with that thesis or do you see it differently? You know, I would say like where we've seen conditions change, it hasn't been systemic across the board. We were starting off in 2022 with the record setting levels of just pent up demand and capital dry powder sitting on the sidelines. We recently, you know, completed an investor survey, polled around 700 global institutional investors and found that 25% of them do want to increase their allocations to real estate. Uh, so you still have a lot of capital to place. I think that where you have seen some buyers kind of move away from the market or even just take a pause from the market, it's kind of the smaller, more niche operators, I would say, that are either very, very local or they're just not as well capitalized long term as, you know, you mentioned a Blackstone. Certainly, they're incredibly well capitalized. Nuveen is incredibly well capitalized. So where you see big balance sheets, really large institutional investors, no, there has been no kind of foot on the brakes, so to speak. But where you've seen kind of a smaller, I think, buyers play who require and rely on leverage to complete their business plans, that's where you've seen kind of a little bit of a pause, I would say. So generally what that has resulted in is just not as deep of a bench when you go to sell an asset, uh, not as deep of a buyer pool than, than we saw a year ago. So let's turn to some of the CRE fundamentals. We frequently talk about the asset classes on the podcast, and I think today we have a few that we wanted to focus on specifically. You know, I, I think the most heavily debated thing from our guests in the past has been around the office space and what that looks like five and 10 years from now, mm -hmm. right? You have the, the believers who think in five years, we'll have forgotten about this and it'll be business as usual and everybody will be back to the office five days a week. 
And you have the other side of the coin, which people say it'll never be the same. And it's a perpetual three, two type hybrid thing. Uh, where do you fall on that side of the argument? Do you have a, a strong opinion yet or is it still TBD? I, I definitely have my opinions, but they're just my opinions. <laughs> uh, I try and rationalize this a lot actually. And again, it's just, you know, the world is not black and white. It's not binary. And I just, we like to remind people of that as frequently as I can. Because if you look to office, Sunbell markets, we are still seeing record level leasing. We're seeing record level rents. And as a result, we are seeing record level prices being set. So these are uh, Nashville's, Charlotte's, Austin's, Miami's of the world. Um, incredibly healthy and strong, really strong demand, population growth, corporate relocations, et cetera. And so those office markets are healthy. Um, some of those are sort of, I, I wouldn't say newly established, but they're not like the old stock of the gateway cities. Um, and as a result of being newer stock, they're kind of like better positioned to be able to transition to uh, net zero carbon. They're better able to transition um, in terms of just uh, technology and being technologically capable of, of creating kind of this omni-channel experience for their tenants, right? Where someone can transition to working from their home or their Airbnb or their hotel back in the office in a really, really seamless way. Um, so that kind of office, I am optimistic on. Smaller footprints, more creative, newer stock, et cetera. Where I see the office market on a national basis long term is that we will probably need reduced supply of office in the next 10 years. And my primary rationale for that is the newer generation. And I really kind of look at my kids as the leading indicator here. Uh, my oldest is uh, 13 going on 14. They're so used to communicating virtually. It's just natural for them, right? They don't have to go and knock on their neighbor's door to play. They're playing remotely um, with video games or they're texting one another, et cetera, or they're on a group chat, FaceTiming their friends after school. So I think that culturally it's going to shift where people just, um, they will eventually feel confined if they're stuck in an office eight hours a day, day after day. Um, I think the newer generations are gonna want to be more mobile, more creative, more flexible. And, you know, they kind of like this instantaneous gratification sort of scenario. And I do not envision five day work week, you know, eight to 10 hours a day in an office day in, day out, like has been the case historically. So I do think the future is, is gonna shift pretty dramatically for office long term. So Carly, I'll throw in some good news and bad news. You know, the bad news is that having had several kids go through the 15 and 16 year old window, it could be dreadful, <laughs> but the good news is it only lasts about 18 months and you come out of it stronger for it. Oh so my I will, gosh. Uh, I, I will throw I that out there for you. Yeah. Uh, I, I hope so. Let's, let's chat in another three or four years and I'll tell you if that's the case or not, but that's right. Crossed, my experience is the same as yours. <laughs> let's turn our attention to hotels. You know, there, it seems like a very bifurcated market, right? The Southwest, Southeast done very well. Uh, vacation destinations, terrifically, you know, you're seeing great occupancy numbers, great, uh, rebound in valuation. Uh, terrific rev par, and then there's New York and Chicago. You know, what's your uh, outlook for hotels in general? Well, look, from a personal standpoint, I have a little bias. I just flew in um, from New York last night. I'm based in, in Charlotte, North Carolina. And someone, please go out and build some new hotels in, in Midtown, please, I beg you. Uh, <laughs> it's just like waiting for updated hotels. But you know, I'll, I'll just preface this with we're not hotel investors, and that is generally because of the cyclicality. You know, it's so seasonal, it's so cyclical. We feel like unless you're one of the really, really, you know, the largest operators kind of nationally, there's so much volatility in the space and you really kind of have to time the market. And generally speaking, market timing is just not necessarily like our core DNA, right? We're long-term investors and we like to, to invest alongside of really long-term macro changes to our environment and our world. With hotels, it's just, it, it, it is extremely volatile and cyclical. Um, that said, as I travel, this is really, really anecdotal. 
but to your point, you know, some, some markets have recovered um, better than others. Long-term, I am a fan of just like tourist driven markets. I know over the last couple of years, they've been really, really beat up. Um, but when I go back to kind of what I mentioned on office is, is an expectation that people will be more mobile, generally speaking, um, and maybe like more transient, that I do think that is, is a solid vote in favor of these tourist driven hotel markets. And I, I, I wouldn't even expect, you know, the hoteling concept to go beho- beyond hotels. Um, so I would expect it long term to, to become more frequent just in your multifamily properties more frequent in your single family rental homes. And I think that, you know, over time, this just, this notion of shorter term Airbnb, Verbo, extension of hotels is just gonna, you know, persist and become a much deeper market. So I am, you know, positive from that aspect. On the other side of the coin, many of the strong performers have been fulfillment centers, data centers, industrial. You've mentioned this a couple of times during the interview how great they have done over the last two years and and other things too, self-storage, student housing uh, also did extraordinarily well over the last couple of years. Do you see that continuing coming out of the pandemic? I do. I'm still very bullish on those sectors, every every single one of them that you just named there. Can we continue to have 40% appreciation um, or total returns? No, that's not sustainable, you know, obviously, right? That, That level of return is not sustainable, but that doesn't mean you go from you know, an annualized return of 40% in, an, in a sector like industrial to a negative 10. That's just not the way real estate behaves or works. So the sectors you just named are just incredibly tight. Less than 4% vacancy on a national basis within industrial. You know, we're the seventh largest owner of industrial in the U.S. So get the benefit of just seeing daily activity and leasing. And there's just been no pullback in the underlying strength of the fundamentals from a leasing velocity perspective, from a rent growth um, perspective, et cetera. So I think the market is just still generally so undersupplied, um, industrial and then many housing markets as well, and housing generally na- on a national basis, that you know the, the, the tightness factor, um, it's just too tight of a market to not be sustainable um, on a positive basis going forward. Going back to the pandemic uh, very quickly, what would you say was your biggest surprise in the pandemic where you say, you know, I didn't see this coming. You know, for me personally, it was student housing. When I heard everybody was going virtual, I thought, what parent is going to pay for their kid to live in a dorm when they can live at home and, and pay $800 a month to just sit in a dorm and take classes remotely? And that turned out to be one of the most resilient asset classes over the last two years that just kind of really blindsided me. Was there something for you over the last two years where you say, I I just didn't see that coming. That was really a surprise how well this segment did or how poorly this segment did compared to what I would have expected when you consider that, you know, unemployment was 20% at one point in, in 2020. Yeah. I mean, look, I think just generally speaking, and I agree with you on student housing for sure. and, And that's actually one of the reasons I've always liked student housing you know, so selectively depending on its location and depending on the university it's serving. But it has a captive consumer base. It has a captive audience. That's just not going to go away year to year. So really like it from that aspect. But I agree with you. I was surprised because I, I was worried about what was going to happen in our student housing portfolio. And the students just didn't leave. They didn't go home. So I think my biggest, you know, surprise and... And I, and I saw this coming, I guess, a little bit was the resilience of the retail sector. So, you know, so many people were so pessimistic on retail on a thematic basis over the last, you know, five plus years that you would have expected because people were just, you know, generally not, not going out, not visiting retail, et cetera. I would have expected to see a lot more store closings, um, vacancies, bankruptcies, et cetera. And it proved to be incredibly resilient. Um, So I think 2021, there were net new openings for retail than closings. And that was really the first year we saw that since 2016. We're also in a scenario of positive absorption now within retail and the lowest number of vacancies within, I think, at least five years. So the retail sector 
proved to be really, really resilient. And I think that's because consumers are continuing to shop. And while e-commerce, you know, definitely spiked during the pandemic, so did consumer spending. And so it just demonstrates, I think, how important an omnichannel experience is and how important a physical store is for customer retention models of, of various retailers. So that I think people were incredibly pessimistic on. I think it just sort of proved, proved it wrong to some extent. That, that too was a big shock for me, especially that shopping center segment, which is a Burlington, a Marshall's, a Joann's, right. a Michael's, right? Really, I mean, it made sense that Walmart and Target did great, right? They sell groceries and that's essential. And it made sense that Grocery Anchor did great and, and the malls struggled and so forth. But that one that had no essentials in it, right? That had a discount, you know, apparel store, a hobby store and so forth. And those did extraordinarily well, very few defaults. And even, even now I, I can't explain that. So it's, uh, to your point, uh, incredible resiliency there and, uh, yes, great absolutely. for CMBS investors for sure. And, and, and for landlords as well. Uh, I'll close with one more question for you. And that is, you know, what keeps you up at night at this point? You know, what is the kind of thing where you say, Hmm, if this happens, you know, we're going to have, and it could be anything, the U.S. economy, it could be commercial real estate in general. What does that think? Or maybe it's your 13 year old. I don't know. It's uh... <laughs> Well, okay. My, I have three kids and they definitely, you know, I am up at night worrying about them. I mean, that is, that's parent life. So absolutely. You're right on that one. I would say, you know, generally speaking, just, just the macro backdrop. It's, it's a, it's a strange period of time. Um, and it's one that I've not really experienced in my career in terms of there being so many dynamics at play. So I mentioned before, as a long-term investor, you know, what I always say is the only thing trying to time short run business cycles will ensure is that you'll be wrong in the long run. And really the markets, you know, we, we always define business cycles as recessions. We can continue to define it that way. But when you see pullbacks just in the public markets of 10, 15, 20% and we're able to kind of like see through those times, it's just become a much more volatile world. So you have to be able to see your way out of it to manage through. At the same time, you can't um, have your head in the sand in terms of what's going on around you. So we have this really unpredictable inflationary environment that no one can, can honestly control, right? It's, it's sort of out of everyone's hands. We can't control it through monetary or fiscal policy. It's really kind of, it, it, it's really, really unpredictable. So, so that worries me. The geopolitical environment currently worries me. You know, rate movements too fast, too soon are concerning right now. Increase in debt costs are concerning right now. So if you kind of put all of these concerns in a blender and try and blend it together and get a really, really good outlook, it's just not clear, right? I like crystal clear blue water. I like to go to the Caribbean. The water is a little, you know, feeling a little murky right now. You know, my concern is just how quickly and how aggressively the Fed feels like they have to move in order to control the inflationary environment. And again, I mentioned that you can't really control that, the situation right now with monetary um, or fiscal policy. The only way to do it is really, really get very, very aggressive to, to pump the brakes on, on demand. And so that's what we're watching incredibly closely. At the same time, no asset class and no investor is immune to systematic market risk. Um, you just have to be really, really cautious, deliberate, and clever and selective um, on how you approach times of uncertainty and how you invest around them. Now, we ask this question, and usually of, of every guest, just to kind of close it out. What's the vibe at Nuveen these days? Is it a five-day work week? Is it a is it a hybrid? Are people back? Is the pandemic over in Charlotte? What is the, what is the vibe at, at your office? Uh, we are always, uh, we're always in hype mode. So we're always positive vibes at Nuveen. <laughs> That's why I love the company so much. But we are uh, back to the office. All employees are back to the office. We are back to the office on 
sort of a hybrid flex basis, but everyone has an individual space, an individual office or desk, et cetera. So that's not changed. Um, I would say that most people are back to the office and it's great because there's a lot of discussion happening, a lot of energy. Um, and it's just like great, great, great to see people in person and collaborate in person and have these like side conversations um, where you're getting ideas and just, you know, ideation that you weren't getting through Zoom, which was just such a predictable <laughs> schedule over the last couple of years. But, you know, we're, we're real estate people, so we're used to traveling all the time. And uh, any given day, you're never going to find 100% of people back in the office, but it does feel like we are back to normal. Um, in terms of our office attendance at this point. Well, thank you so much, Carly. Before we close, we just wanted to give you a chance to plug something. We know that you all have your real access report. Do you want to share a little bit about that? Oh uh, yeah, so uh, we we do release a real access report and you know that is really kind of to tackle our most current thinking um, around a lot of things that we've discussed today. So inflation, market volatility, sectors, cities, kind of what we see going forward, how we view the world, et cetera. And so we work with our global teams on that and we release it on a quarterly basis. And I love it because it's kind of like a magazine sort of style feature, a lot of cool graphics, short articles, very consumable. So it's kind of one of my favorite, favorite pieces that we put out quarterly. You can find it on Nuveen's uh, main website through our research portal. Excellent. And if anyone has questions for Carly or questions for the team, feel free to send that to podcast.trip.com. And with that, we'll close. Thank you to our guest, Carly Tripp from Nuveen. Join us later in the week for our Week in Review as we look at what has happened during the week and how it may be impacting you. For more information, visit trip.com and subscribe to the podcast with your favorite provider. Thank you for listening and stay well. All right. 